called lymphangiolo... Lymphangiolomyomatosis. Myomatosis. Lamb disease. A lamb is rare. Is a rare lung disease. There's no cause. There's no cure. A disease that has no cure. Primarily strikes women of childbearing Young age. Young women of childbearing age. And progressively destroys lung tissue. A cure might be near, but there's not enough money for research. Imagine finding out that your daughter had a fatal disease. A Sharonville woman whose family is literally fighting for her life. My daughter, Andy, was diagnosed with a disease. I, you know, I didn't believe it at first. But Sue Burns refused to let her daughter die without a fight. So the Sharonville music teacher quit her job and launched the Lamb Foundation here out of her home. There was not very much known about Lamb. No research for a cure was done because it's so rare. So we started writing letters to Congress. Sue Burns has taken the fight to Washington, asking them to fund research for rare diseases. Then she persuaded the National Institutes of Health to study the disease. She's just been a great ray of hope for all of us. In 1997, I was pregnant with our second child, and I was walking a very short distance, maybe 50 yards, and I was extremely short of breath. I was on a plane going to Colorado, and that's how they, I was first diagnosed is when my lung collapsed. I was diagnosed with Lamb in January of 98, and I was 34 years old, and my kids were two years old and five years old. I was uh, 29 years old, and I was um, pregnant at the time, and I was about three months pregnant with my first child. It was pure devastation. I mean, just un disbelief. I couldn't believe it. A lot of the doctors looking after me at the time felt it would be in my best interest to abort the pregnancy. We decided, since this was probably our only chance to have children, that we would go ahead with the pregnancy. And Abby was born prematurely at 28 weeks, but it was well worth it. She's the love of my life. She's just a beautiful little girl. and. I wouldn't have changed my choice, even though now I do realize that the, the pregnancy did make my lung condition worse in my case. My two girls, Marissa and Lauren, have kind of grown up with this knowledge of my disease and have been introduced to it along the way, and we've tried not to alarm them. They deal with it pretty well. My oldest, now that she can read and she understands a lot of things better, she's afraid. and. That's hard for me to deal with her fear because I have to console her and tell her that, you know, we're doing everything we can and mommy's going to be okay. I think one of the more difficult things is people don't believe that I have disease. I mean, I look very healthy. I look normal. They're not seeing an x-ray or CAT scan of my lungs. They're seeing my outer appearance. I came from the National Institutes of Health back in Maryland home on oxygen and had to shock my whole family and all my friends that now I'm on oxygen. and. Then bam, next thing I know, I need a lung transplant. It happens so extremely fast. I've been on a transplant list for a year now. Um, it could be any day now. It's a bit of a waiting game. You, you never know when it's gonna come. You know, eventually it will, so you have to be prepared for it now, even though it may not happen for six more months. The money that's been raised here locally and through all the Land Foundation's efforts has been a real boost for me because I feel like that money is what's going to solve this thing and that's my hope for the future. The Lamb Foundation has raised four million dollars in six years. At this point in time our greatest source of income is the special fundraising events run by the Lamb patients and their families and we've had phenomenal success. For instance, the Seattle group just raised, I think, $187,000. The Cincinnati group raised $92,000. The group in Colorado raised $50,000. And the letter writing campaigns that they're participating in. So these kind of events are really having an impact on our research. It's really making it move. And it's very, very important that they continue. I think there have been three major breakthroughs in LAM. The first was Dr. Hensky discovered the genetic defect that appears to be the most common one in LAM. When I heard that women with LAM develop angiomyolipomas, 
which occur in tuberous sclerosis and also have the same lung disease as tuberous sclerosis women develop, I decided that there must be a genetic connection. It was a, a tremendous surprise to us, but also very exciting because we now understood genetically what was going on. And it was a day I'll never forget. And that focused our attention on a specific pathway. And then fly biologists, Drosophila biologists, just so happened to be working on that pathway and to have worked out a lot of the molecular details of what goes wrong uh, when that pathway is disrupted. What Dr. Vera Krumskaya did was to apply that science to, to a LAM patient in a very direct way. Our preclinical study showed that using rapamycin, we could significantly inhibit growth of cells derived from LAM nodules. LAM cells grow abnormally because they're missing a control protein called tuberin. Rapamycin mimics the function of tuberin. It acts exactly like tuberin in the cell. I think it has the potential to slow the spread of the disease. We'll only be able to know that for sure through clinical trials, but the biology makes sense. I think the rapamycin study is very, very exciting. I'm excited about it personally because I got to attend the TS conference in Virginia where I heard the presentations from the scientists talking about the results that they had had in their lab. I think that this is a confluence of events that none of us would have predicted. One of the scientists came to me and said, you know, I think we'll look back on this this weekend and know that we have made history. So what needs to happen next is we need to know if this drug works in a human being with tuberous sclerosis or LAM. And so to answer that question, we're going to study 30 patients in Cincinnati while they're on the drug rapamycin over the course of a year. These studies are expensive because MRIs are expensive, clinic visits are expensive, the drug is very expensive, and that's why LAM Foundation fundraising is so important at this point in time. So we have to sustain this momentum and make sure that this progress continues so that we can keep up the good work and make good things happen as we have in the past. It's quite unique to have these major breakthroughs come in such rapid succession. And I think the reason for that is that the foundation uses resources effectively. I don't think there's another foundation that has the kind of track record that we have for the amount of money that we have put into research compared to the administrative cost that we have spent. We try to keep those at an absolute minimum and put every single penny we can into basic and clinical research. And as a mother of a daughter with land, that's where I wanted to go. This is a very important time in lamb research. This is the most important time for lamb in history. We don't know what this drug is going to do yet, but it looks very promising. We need to understand more. We need to apply this to patients. We need to know if this is the right drug and the best drug. We have a chance here to test and maybe help somebody. I think we're on the right track. I think we can make a difference. My hope is that it will happen in the lifetime of the women we serve today. You know, many of these women say, I know that what the foundation is doing for me today won't benefit me, but I want to help women of the future. That's not good enough for me. I want this to be in their lifetime. I want it to be in my daughter's lifetime, and I want it to be in my lifetime.